Well, hello everybody. Uh, this is Rattle, uh, Rattle Magazine's Rattlecast uh, for uh, what's the date? October first, two thousand nineteen. Uh, I'm glad everybody who stuck with us. Uh, thanks so much to uh, Michelle Lales, Mr. Wamble. Um, you know, I forgot to push go live. So we did a whole 10 minute thing. Me and Jamie talked for a while and uh, we weren't streaming anywhere. We were just having fun. So we're going to sort of do this all over again and I uh, hope you enjoy it the second time. Uh, so, so uh, as always, the Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since uh, 1995. And um, we just love poems, and we want these episodes to be a way to share and celebrate poetry with as many people as we possibly can. So thanks so much for clicking the like button, for subscribing. If you're listening on iTunes later, um, uh, make sure you click the, you know, rate us high and, and subscribe that way. And that's the way uh, poetry spreads around the world. So please help us out in that way. And now let's move on to Jamie Hecht. Um, Jamie Hecht is one of the poets I most admire. Uh, his his book Limousine Midnight Blue is one of the poem or one of the books of poetry that I have on my personal keeper shelf. I kind of have two bookshelves going in the office here, which you can't see. But um, over to the I guess it would be your left. But uh, one of them is my temporary bookshelf, and one of them is my I want to keep this book um, and have have access to it. And um, Limousine Midnight Blue is one of those. But he has a new book out. Uh, that just came out um, called, and I'll show it on screen here. Um, this is Dodo Feathers, poems from 1989 to 2019. And um, so it's a collected book of poems, a lot of it in, in blank verse and a lot of it in other kinds of forms. He's a formal type poet, which I really admire. I'm a big fan of formal poetry. And these are just beautiful poems from an amazing human being. He's one of the smartest people I know, and I don't say that lightly. Um, he is, um, he's also a psychoanalyst. He is a, uh, literary scholar. He's translated Homer and he's also an actor, which you'll be able to hear. I wish I could read poems like him. Uh, let's bring him in right now though. This is, uh, Jamie Hecht. Uh, sorry for, for jumping in suddenly there when you were <laughs> ripening your nose, but we're all set. We're good to go. Uh, Jamie, can, can you say hi? Yes, I can. Hello, and thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much, and thanks for waiting through our double feature beginning. We had a big 10-minute warm-up where we got to do the whole thing twice, which was really fun. Um, it was fun, yeah, and thank you, Tim, for that really beautiful introduction. I was quite touched by that. I appreciate it. Well, it's just the truth. You know, I, uh, I, I can't help but be honest, and, um, and you are genuinely one of my all-time favorite poets, so I'm so glad to see a second book come out by you. I think you're one of the poets who, who needs to have yeah. books out. And um, um, so I really appreciate what you're doing there. I feel the same. I'm a big fan of American Fractal, your Red Hen Press book. Yeah, yeah. Our books came out at about the same time. And, uh, mm -hmm. and now you have a second one, which makes me feel like I am really behind the ball now that you have Dota Feathers out. Um, you're a young man than I, though, so don't worry about that. Is that true? I think uh, I feel old. I'm... <laughs> One year. Oh old. my God! Well, well, you look, uh, you look much younger than that. You, you know, I have way more gray hair and the old beard than you do. Uh, well, you wear it well. Well, thank you. Uh, so, do you want to start us out with a poem from Dota Feathers? Eclipse. Okay. Poem in the book. A stand of trees still holds the weedy hill behind the school I went to. Forty years ago, their topmost nerves all swaying in the cold world's breath that swells their plastic bags. Tangled twigs are black against the deep and clouded blue. Third week in November, ravens, ice, wet Burger King debris. Earth's shadow slides. A fragment of the night whose fall has pierced the day. Below me, worms digest the castings their ancestors made when I was in fourth grade by centennial penance on my new fake Schwinn. 
The war in Vietnam had ended hours before. I kicked the ball and saw it hide the sun an instant. So we all looked down and saw the silent disk of darkness cross the grass. The flat, immortal shadow of the dying, solid sphere. Beautiful poem, Jamie. That's a great way to start, because I wanted to talk about um, uh, Blank Verse. And you have a mm-hmm. YouTube channel you just started called Blank Verse Trance, which everybody else should follow. You know, I should say, I think I forgot to say in my sort of rehash of everything that please do click subscribe to our channel if you're watching. If you're listening on uh, iTunes, please rate us and subscribe there. No matter how you're doing it, please click the like button and rate us because that's how poetry spreads around. And that is how we make the world a better place by bringing poetry out in the world where it can be read and heard and appreciated. Um, but while you're doing that, go to Blank Verse Trance. You can type that into the search bar. And that is Jamie's new channel, which he just started maybe a month or two ago. Uh, but anyway, Jamie, so, so on your first video, you talk about Blank Verse um, as a way of... really. You talk about poetry as a drug. And, and Blank Verse is a way to set up expectation and then fulfill it to, to make it drug-like in, in the neural... Um, and you know your soup of of uh, neurons that are going on there. So so how would right. you should talk a little bit about that? Why is poetry like a drug? Uh, poetry is like lots of things, and it's like a pharmakon, ancient Greek word from which we get the form pharmacy. Uh, it meant both drug and poison, uh, depended on the context, as uh, quite a bit always does. Uh, the way in which poetry is like a drug is that it results in a change of state, right? Change of brain state, sure, but much more interestingly, perhaps, a change of experience, you know, a change of self-state, what it feels like to be you when your mind is saturated with the presence of a good enough poem. And it seems to me what makes a good enough poem, to put the matter as briefly as I can, is that just as what makes a, a fully present person, one who is alive indeed and has interiority, is a union of body and soul, be that supernatural or some other way you might wish to frame it, so it is with the poem, where the physical part which corresponds to the flesh is the poem's sound system, its phonetic embodiment, right, which occurs in your material embodiment, your body, resonates the bones of your skull and so on, it's transinducing. And the soul of the poem is the sense, the meaning. Just as a person is alive when... uh, soul and body are united in good order so it is with a poem the poem lights up as as a living work when those two are in utmost harmony and you know occasionally one one hopes to occasionally be blessed that is by such a poem whether i have i cannot say that's not up to me Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's how i think about it so so is that why you you write in verse though instead of uh, free verse usually um, and do you ever write in free verse? I was wondering about that, too. I was looking through the book, sort of finding examples. Yeah. And, and it's so, you know, the thing about uh, the English language is it's so close to meter naturally that, yes. um, that it's almost hard to tell, you know, what it, what's form and what's not when someone's using it really well either way. So uh, yes, do you so, consciously sure. write in verse all the time? Or, or some of those, like, like um, First Divorce, which is the first poem of yours that we published. Um, I didn't go through and count feet. But is that, is that free verse or is that metrical too? Well, it's not blank verse because it's um, a much longer line than a pentameter line. Yeah, but, but still iambic, pent- or iambic meter, right? Is it? It is indeed iambic. Yeah. It has a, there's some hexameter and so on, but like the thing, I take your point, it's very much true. The thing is uh, a metrical poem, and I don't know that I'd call it a formal one mm-hmm. because its structure isn't a large feature of what it is. Uh, but the the long line and the speedy pace that's built into it, if I've succeeded, is very much a part of the ethos of the poem. Mm-hmm. But it's over, if I say, the number of lines, you know, or the shape of the thing on the page, that I'm not invested in. I do write what one might call free verse sometimes. Yeah, okay. But, you know, Robert Frost said it's like playing tennis without a net. Mm-hmm. Well... <laughs> I have a poem called Gloves, where the line is so short, it's tiny, it looks like a postage stamp, it's in dodo feathers. You could call that free verse, but 
it has nothing to do with the kind of Kenneth Coke all over the page, lowercase things and this impulsive kind of sculpting, the alphabet uh, sprinkling down the page. I have no interest in that kind of thing. Frankly, for me, it's not poetry. Mm-hmm. I respect other people include that in their definition of poetry. Still others prefer it above all else. It all has its place. Mm-hmm. I'm so uninterested in that kind of thing that I just I'm whenever I use the word poetry, that's not what I'm actually referring to, that kind of thing. Interesting. But nor is it only blank verse. And on blank verse trance, I do videos of a lot of poems that are not iambic uh, unrhymed iambic pentameter at all, which is what the the phrase blank verse means. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what is your goal with that new channel? And um, what are you trying to do? I have no idea <laughs> what my goal is. But I will say that um I'm a very creative person uh, in a variety of art forms, I guess. Um, Certainly, uh, I'm okay at them enough that I enjoy them. And I'd like to believe that among some of these, yeah, you know, I'm pretty serious. I'm in there doing it with a lot of passion and devotion put in many, many years. And poetry is by far and away the most important one to me. And the YouTube channel is a way of putting that out there. Uh, My creativity has a kind of exuberance to it that can uh, appear, I think, it's fair to say, somewhat unusual. And there's a temperament which goes along with that that could be described that way, too. Uh, The reciting on video of these poems shows that quite clearly. And, uh, you know, I'm a Shakespearean actor. I did 10 productions um, between 2008 and 2015. And uh, there's a lot of pain in these poems in this new book, which I'm here to promote, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of self-disclosure. But I make my living as a psychoanalyst and psychotherapist. And so I find myself eager to point out, hoping that this will actually help any problem that may be there that I don't really know about, but do worry about, that it's better to seek a therapist, uh, whether me or someone else, who has reckoned uh, with difficulty in life of various forms, including, I think, the relational form. And many of the poems are about heartbreak, uh, divorce, breakup, breakups in relationship. Ironically, all four of the poems of mine that have appeared in Rattle uh, at t- t- 10-year intervals mm-hmm. were about breakups. Uh, <laughs> going through that stuff equips you to help people with it. It gives you an understanding of what's going on there and so mm-hmm. on. Uh, nor is everything that I say in these poems true of me. There is a horrific poem called, a stanza in a poem called Angels with No Skin in the Game that says, Our childless midlife Christmases in jail. Thank God none of those four terms applies to me. <laughs> Though I do respect Christmas. <laughs> uh, well, why don't you uh, read some more poems? I will. Okay. And remember to let me know what page you're on and let me say too if anybody has any questions for jamie hecht will be go just use the chat window on youtube and i'm watching that that's how i realized that i actually wasn't uh, recording uh, mm-hmm. so uh, having said oh, oh no go ahead here's a poem uh which is of that stripe uh, called 80 million millennials i wrote it in a restaurant uh as you can hear and what what page is it on oh six ah okay page six I hate the way millennials are certain not a problem is the same as, yes, I'll bring you the fork that you just asked me for. And yes, I noticed the respect in your request since you were once a waiter in the past, just as I am now, since I am 23 and you have been divorced as long as I have been alive. So, yes. I'll bring a fork and dignity for both of us before your wedge of iceberg lettuce comes along, cold and cloven and alone, like you, sir. Then again, I guess my generation ate the last fish in the sea, clear-cut the Adirondacks, and let Nestle steal the glaciers of Mount Shasta for a song. 80 million people can't be wrong. 80 million millennials is the name of that one. This is a very strange uh, philosophical poem on page 24. Uh, 
Limousine Midnight Blue was 50 uh, elegies for President Kennedy, all 14 lines, but they weren't sonnets. Uh, it had clearly all one theme. Dodo Feathers has uh, five different sections, uh, and I'll just mention uh, uh, the first is uh, pretty general, but a lot about my personal life. The second is about literature. There's some translations of mine from Homer in there, but the, the ancient Greek book I translated is Sophocles' Three Theban Plays, and that's from Wordsworth Editions, uh, published in 2005. Uh, section uh, three is um, uh, a kind of, there's some funny poems in it, uh, and some other ones, poems about music and so on, and uh, the last section has a lot of animals and a lot of politics. Fine. The meaning of life is the location of the universe for my parents. As for life, Others lived it before I was born. Others will live it after I am gone. I am living it now. Until today, this was something I simply knew. But now it has a body like a bird, and the blue fact of it is hovering in front of me. My grandfather died between two chairs. My dad sat at his left, and I sat at his right. Only three places to be. Only one place at a time. As for life, others lived it before I was born. Others will live it after I am gone. Like you, I am living it now. Only stories within life can have meaning. Life as a whole just can't. The universe can't move. It isn't in a place. Only positions inside it are somewhere. Before I'm gone, others will experience youth, house to house. The tracks of them unfurl the dawn's ephemeral ribbon. I miss my mother. She had a nightgown made of silk that hung deep in the walk-in closet. When nobody was home, I crept inside and rubbed the milky hem against my cheek. Others lived it before I was born. The meaning of life is the location of the universe. As for life, I am living it now. Strange poem. Uh, I want to read some short ones and then turn to other stuff. Um, you ever wonder what it would be like if... Um, Cookie Monster got a job at, you know, like a Pepperidge Farm factory. You know, he's in there all day trying to control himself. And it'd be, you know, it would be, it could get ugly, right? Well, what, I asked myself, would it look like if Oscar the Grouch himself were to swim across the entirety of the Pacific Garbage Patch? And this poem is called Oscar the Grouch Crosses the Pacific Garbage Patch. And what page? It's on 61. A floating wasteland, frowning at the sky, sprawling great as Texas on the toxic sea, threaded by the needle of his tiny transit. As he goes, the gap of his brief wake is closed. The noise of the garbage is thick yet soft, mingling news from plastic wood and air, as all those surfaces yield senseless sound, shaped by chaos to the long white noise. To Oscar, this is music, glorious enough to saturate his spirit with its secret song, no living soul for miles. As Oscar swims, he sings a haunting version of his own theme. I love trash. Now in a minor key and slowed down to the tempo of a dirge, his soul is bared, thrilled and very scared. Oscar the Grouch crosses the Pacific Garbage Patch. A poem called The Golem. 
That's uh, which, as you may know, is a is a Jewish um, mythic idea in which a, a rabbi who's particularly holy um, is allowed by God to have the magical powers to create uh, uh, what appears to be a living being out of clay, you know, can do stuff. And, so and the, a golem is always made by a rabbi, uh, generally in a Jewish ghetto, with a mission that usually has to do with the protection of children. The golem. One day, the Rebbe made a golem. The riverbank is all clay, miles long. Down beside the rushing stream, gingerly stepped the bearded Jew, his canvas bag of sculptor's tools slung across his pious shoulders, shawl. In his hands, twin pails to fill and empty on the wagon's floor. The Rebbe loaded up the cart all day with all the clay his horse could bear, homeward to the cellar with its tin chute, down which rolled 104 clay cores into position by the door. Secret, now they float in air. Held there by the Rebbe's mind of humble power, out now come his tools, some long steel instruments, some wood with loops of rigid wire. He set to work and carved the heap into a giant man, making his trunk ribs twelve pair, his mighty legs, two feet, a genital, until the time of truth penultimate when down into the man's blank front the Rebbe leaned and with his old hands made the golem's very face. Magical he moved, conjuring by God, the holy name he dared inscribe upon the broad, wet forehead of the golem. So, with his prayers, contentment with his lot, surrender, detachment and attachment, both in moderation, meditation, holy charms and psalms in haunting melodies sung with shaking, he pierced a pinhole into heaven, through which a free and curious soul swam willing into the solid empty golem who blinked. He blinked again, his nostrils flared and for the first time breathed a breath, sat up and shook his head, smiled, moved to rest his chin upon his knee and wondered what would be the mission for which he, a golem, had been summoned into life with holy labor and with elements of earth and heaven. The golem. A poem called the golem. From the animal section, here's a poem called the razorback. The razorback is a kind of fierce uh, boar. Lives in the forest, now very rare, enormous, incredibly resilient, tough creatures, almost impossible to kill without firearms. Called the razorback. Our wagon train departed in the fall. We tracked the razorback, magnificent, a granite boar, ungodly, huge and black. A waving comb of bristles on its rock of a back. We lost decades in the forest. We found dung and tracks, broad troughs of broken branches. The razorback came at us like a living wall. My friends, he gored to death, but I survived. We broke him in the ashes of his home. As tempted as I am to read uh, some of the booming kind of thunder and lightning poems in the book, which are, uh, you know, like a little bit over a, a page each. Mm -hmm. Long line, single space, incantatory, passionately felt, uh, if I've succeeded, rather musical. Uh, with a booming kind of masculine strident spondy ridden miltonic uh, type of sensibility again from my perspective what it's worth uh, instead i want to uh, share some sonnets with you because that is what i've been writing more recently yes yeah, somebody asked uh, jamie uh, mr wamble which is a pen name of somebody asked uh, what does your writing process look like and do the poems just come or are they thought out and planned so i think that's a perfect segue into where these sonnets came from you were just talking about that before uh, we came on air 
Yeah, that's true. Um, last year, something very strange uh, happened to me, which is consistent, I feel, with uh, my uh, nature, um, but not with um, the way things ordinarily go, I'm afraid. I, I had this stormy period of creativity, unlike any I've, I've ever had before. For 18 days, I wrote Shakespearean sonnets between November 17th and December 5th, and I, 50 of them. And they were all about a breakup that had occurred that summer. And two of them were published in Rattle, uh, to my absolute delight. Uh, here's one. And the epigraph is from W.H. Auden, the first line of a famous, beautiful love poem of his. What's in your mind, my dove, my coney? Just kind of funny rabbit. I'll never quote again, my dove. My or guess the mystery of what you want. I'll focus on work and make some money to spend my days remembering. I can't convince myself it's not because a curse has cast its karmic spear and run me through, nor make last summer happen in reverse, nor cry my way back to our old apartment. Satan cannot die his way to heaven whence he came. Win back the love of God any more than I can scale the garden wall and get back in to you or hide my heart's red horror with a fig leaf. Now I'm bleeding sonnets like a stuck pig. That's the uh, first one in the book, I think, maybe the second one. I don't yeah, yeah, there you have that one. Uh, he, he, here, if I may, is another sonnet from that book called Sensible Woman Speaks. Now, I realize this is a, no real human being has ever said these words, okay? Give me someone reasonably bright, not dumb, but neurotypical enough, alive, but not too rough with me at night, upright, but not hooked on RFK. Stuff about my childhood shouldn't throw him, but his background should be smooth. I want a guy who's down to hit the gym three times a week. If I'm sick, he'll soothe my headache with a lullaby, but not keep crooning after I get well. I'll purse my lips. He'll kiss me hot, but not too hot. No grandiose dark poet high on blank verse. I need a mystic like Godzilla needs a magazine. Please, God, give me Mr. In-Between. The poem, the poem always makes me smile. I really enjoy that thing. Um, this one called Silver Bow, and it's an epigraph from Homer about Apollo, the god of the silver bow. But come, let us ask some mantis or a holy man or even some interpreter of dreams, for a dream, too, comes from Zeus. Kaigar tonar ek de os estin. The starry night inside me burns black bright. Unconscious mind is walking through the park. A figure of the solid darkness walks in daylight. Apollo of the silver bow, whose loaded arc makes instantly a flash of silver and a wound. If he is angry, we will be struck down. The starry night inside us, vast and round, will be dispelled by streetlights of the town. Our summer shattered into shards, our music, random rain of notes, our nights of love forgotten or remembered wrong. Red brick, where milky marble was, one long left glove left draped across an empty chair at noon, our only sunshine borrowed from the moon. Silver bow. I'm looking for a publisher for this book of 50 sonnets. It's now called 57 sonnets, in fact, because it's grown uh, since then. 57 sonnets now, wow. It's now called 57 sonnets. I also recently, I've, on a lark, I wrote this thing called Seven 
sonnets on the Rolling Stones. About the process, um, I am one of these many writers who is sort of obsessed whenever I talk about this issue uh, with it being uh, with the fact that it's out of my hands, that there is some principle which, from my perspective, transcends the human mind and uh, the conscious mind, really. and it seems to me the human community as well. And that the muse or goddess, Homer uses both words for the same thing, Menenaide Thea, goddess, and Andra Moyenapa, Musa, muse, he's talking about the same person, is the unconscious. The goddess is the unconscious. Oh, well, that's a relief. We don't have to do anything supernatural, we believe anything crazy. But the unconscious is the goddess. Wait, what? Well, I'm sorry, what? Well, it's alive, isn't it? You see. Uh, good luck getting that from a heap of protons. But that's a separate matter. These concerns, however, my intellectual appetite, which is rather far ranging. I don't know if you can. I've got quite a few of these uh, case bookcases in my, my palm. Pay into the verse that I write. Um, I try and make it clear. It's very important to me that every poem I publish, and indeed every poem I write and call finished, make sense. Poems that don't make sense to me have their place, Lord knows. I'm not casting a spurgeon or anything, but from my perspective, it had better be clear at the very least to me what on earth I'm trying to get said, if it's going to be clear to anybody else. I hope it is. What, what do you think about the sort of, I, I kind of feel like um, the job of the poet is to translate the unconscious into consciousness. Do you think, do you like that definition? Well, that's a classic uh, uh, formulation and a good one for what is the thing about psychoanalysis that makes people get better. Uh, therapeutic action is the name of that question. What is the therapeutic action of a given treatment? Is How does it actually help? By making the unconscious conscious was the answer to that for many years. It's not the only answer. Others preceded it, accompanied it, and it's not something people quote very often anymore, but they, yeah, they still do. It's part of what goes on. Maybe. I think it's more than that. I think it's for something which does not yet exist to um, enter a kind of aperture into the observable world through, a, uh, well, this is what the poem The Golem was about, right? A pinhole in heaven through which a free and willing soul swam into the solid, empty golem. Something comes along. Wilfred Behan was a psychoanalyst who used to say things like this. Uh, but Plato says it all the time in the Ion, in the Symposium, and so on. This thing, which is not you, and which I experience as female, Robert Graves wrote a whole book arguing that it has to be, not my position, and divine, it, it opens something in you, the poem goes through it, you try and be quiet while it's happening so the goddess can talk, you get out of her fucking way, as it were, and you write down whatever it is that she says. That was what it was like to translate Sophocles too, except there, the speaking principle did not feel female, it felt like the old man in the ground. Now, my left brain regards these ideas as ridiculous. Of course, Sophocles perished 24 centuries ago. He's not talking to a New York Jew in order to get the play translated properly. But that was what my spirit experienced. And so rather than laugh it out of court, deciding that it's useless, I have a truce, you see, between my left brain that laughs at such things, and my right brain, which experiences in rare circumstances usually having to do with making something, translating or writing something, or sculpting whatever. Um, please let me finish that sentence properly. Um, I shouldn't have turned off the captions at the beginning. I'm 51, folks. <laughs> something comes through, the poem comes through, you try and get quiet. Yeah, that's right. It works for both making poems and for translation. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was Sophocles talking. The truce I have, that's what it is. Between my left brain and my right, I could never have thought of without reading this brilliant, beautiful book by uh, a lovely uh, old Englishman named Ian McGilchrist. Ah, I was just about to bring that up. The, the master, the master. Yep, yep, the master is emissary. It's a great book. And, and that's my we've talked about it on this podcast before. Um, we have with the, on the Richard uh, Gilbert show. But uh, but mm -hmm. I, I kind of feel like the the. You know, frontal lobe of the left hemisphere is the one that focuses on things and translates, you know, it, it's the linguistic center. And then we have this entire brain, um, you know, the right brain that's actually the master, as Ian McGilchrist says. And uh, that's the one who makes these associative leaps and makes the connections and tries to understand 
the way we live in this chaotic, complicated world where everything fits together and we're all interconnected in a strange way and everything we believe and the ways we think are just archetypes of um, you know, that have been constructed over time by the left brain to make sense of it. And the right brain makes new meaning, which is the logos and blah, blah, blah. But we've talked about all this. And uh, I love that book. Yeah, yeah. Ian McGilchrist, uh, The Master and His the Emissary. Left brain, the left brain doesn't make any sleeping ceramic ladies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't know how to do that. Yeah, McGilchrist um, uh, brings all this modern neuroscientific research, dismisses the silly popularizations of the 1970s that pretended the hemispheres uh, had separate jobs. Everything the brain does needs both hemispheres. And McGilchrist says, the hemispheres need one another, but only the right hemisphere knows this. He says they conjure into existence two different worlds of experience. Well, because I read that book, I was able to have this insight five years ago or so, which changed everything for me, or quite a bit. It is as obvious to my left brain that there is no God, as it is obvious to my right brain that there is a God. Mm. This truce allowed both um, parts of self, if you will, to have their dignity uh, without the conflict that had really impeded, I think, my um, spiritual and intellectual growth to some degree for a long time because it felt like there would be a loss of integrity involved if I were to go around believing in uh, uh, you know, unicorns and so on. But it turned out that that wasn't at all what... Um, what theism was about. I am not a pious man. I'm not uh, able to make much use of religion, which is perhaps unfortunate. I have not yet ever decided to wield it, you mm -hmm. know, toward having a spiritual life. Maybe I will one day. But I do think and read and converse and listen about about spiritual subjects, you know, quite a bit. I rarely use the words, rather hackneyed, but there it is. I like to read about mysticism. Yeah, yeah. I graph in one of my poems from Meister Eckhart. People say that God is the greatest of beings, but... I say that God is as far above being and nothingness as the sun is above a fly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Left brain, it's <laughs> nonsense. Right brain, it's paradox. Mm -hmm. which, ha which understands music better, the musicologist or the composer? Uh, the professor of music history or the improvising, you know, Jimi Hendrix, uh, uh, amazing improviser, person, Sour of on, and so on and so on. Being in love, it really is dopamine. It's a fucking molecule, no question. But does that capture more than half the truth of it? Clearly no. You know? Complementary constructs like wave and particle. That's where mm -hmm. I'm at. Yeah, and you need both. You know, like light wouldn't work unless it was both a wave and a particle. And our brains and our consciousness wouldn't work unless it was both spiritual and, um, and, and uh, material. Um, a kind of um, maybe segues into the other thing I wanted to talk about with you, which is, um, oh, do you want to read some from Limousine Midnight Blue? Maybe we should. Maybe that'll be an even better segue. Let's do that first. Well, maybe let's let's right. let's do, let's talk about this question first, because okay. uh, Limousine Midnight Blue is about um, you know the Kennedy assassination and and it's um, fifty four frames from the Zapruder film or fifty how many <laughs> fifty frames of course a, a, a round nice number. Uh, and, and, and we live in this world where reality is not what people think is reality. Whether you're talking about psychoanalytics or you're talking about the news, nothing is true. You know, like nothing people believe, so little of what people believe is the actual reality. And um, how do you write in a world like that? That's something I struggle with. Um, you know, the reality of the Kennedy assassination, the realities of geopolitics, they're not what's on the nightly news. And uh, you, you put that together really well in Limousine Midnight Blue. Um, but, but knowing this, uh, you know, I looked at the back of uh, Dodo Feathers, and it was blurbed by Peter Dale Scott, who we published. Um, and he, brilliant poet he's as well a, as an amazing. Yeah, a brilliant poet as well as an amazing contemporary historian. He invented the word, I think, uh, the deep state, didn't he? coin that term? It came from a Turkish author, but Peter Dale Scott was the first American writer to make use of it. And it was an incredibly potent idea. And it was in the title of uh, his book. Um, well, mm -hmm. he has many books, but his book, that is, I've forgotten the full thing, but he was the first person in America to use the phrase 
it was so potent that it later got rendered useless by being brought into mm -hmm. mainstream. As everything and <laughs> yeah. feathered with the notion that it is something, uh, uh, you know, uh, fictional, which various unhinged persons uh, believe is the case. And yet we all agree that, of course, there's a clandestine state. That's what um, the alphabet soup of mm -hmm. agencies uh, uh, exist to be. You know, so sure that's yeah. yeah well, it, question okay. I think it's missing in public discourse around this issue of truth and truthiness and mm -hmm. so on. What's missing is criteria. How do we claim to know whatever it is that we claim to know? On what is the claim based? When you go to the footnotes at the back of a book by, say, Gerald Posner, um, a lone nutist uh, who believes that you know Oswald killed the president, the footnotes don't lead anywhere. They lead to sources that don't exist or that say the opposite of what Posner is saying. When you follow the footnotes from an author like the late Michael C. Rupert, may his name be for a blessing in the world to come, you find government documents, often things that they were reluctant to release and only did through a Freedom of Information Act after the principal actors named in it had perished the natural course of things, and so on. There are things that can be established quite firmly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that there's so much noise mixed in with the signal, and that, it seems to me, is, of course, what you're really talking about. One discussion is how to deal with that in nonfiction, and that's much more urgent. And the other is what you're, I think, asking mm -hmm. me, which is a beautiful question, how do you deal with it in literature? Yeah, it's something that I kind of I struggle with. Um... You know, it seems like there's nothing more important than um, revealing the occluded, I think, you know? And, and you did that with Limousine Midnight Blue. And and maybe you might have messed me up for writing poetry, because what is the point of poetry if you're not revealing what's hidden, you know? And that's what you do in Limousine Midnight Blue. And, and how do you write other things? Like, you know, what is more important than... Um, revealing the truth of the big lie. Do you know what I mean? You write about such personal topics too. So how do you balance the two? I guess is what I'm asking. I do not know. Uh, it reminds me of somebody asking Peter Dale Scott about uh, his doing both um, poetry and being a historian or um, another person comes to mind who writes about politics as well as linguistics, a uh, person at MIT at any rate. Um, there are some political poems. Counterfactual is the one in Dodo Feathers from which the title mm -hmm. comes. And uh, the other loud one is a couple of political poems, but the other big one is Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. Osworth Field. On page 35 of Limousine Midnight Blue is a poem called Zapruda Film Frame 168 or Z168. Begins with The Riddle of the Sphinx. What walks on four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon, three legs in the evening, and moves the swiftest on the fewest legs? What has Addison's disease, chronic back pain, sex addiction, a nasty speed habit, the front of Jove himself, an eye like Mars to threaten and command, a rocking chair which that pituitary cretin will destroy? that history is turning on its hinges toward the dark, that one of them is you, that everything you started has been smashed, except a voyage to the barren stone that hangs as our reminder there is nowhere else to breathe. We know. Stuck in the hillside, one feeble jet of gas tells how symbols work one thing that you can see stands for something absent that you can't. Z168. And the only other poem I think I'll read from uh, Limousine Midnight Blue, Red Hand Press, 2009, is Z193. And these poems are about the events of the Zapruder film, the famous 24 second. Uh, the Bell Powell movie camera home movie of the murder of the President of the United States. Z193. Oh, the film shows the limousine uh, driving down the road as the shots are fired and the victim is um, wounded uh, repeatedly and, 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 and until he's gone. Just about now, the fellow on the underpass or by the fence is almost done 
sighting me, and soon the squeeze will finish, and a round will eat my neck. I have about one sec um, left to glide along, oblivious of just how utterly my plans are gone. My brother's heart destroyed, the gold of everyone turned by usurious warlords into lead, a mile-high mountain of artillery for every raven in the field. I know I'm coming to the end of something, but I don't know what it is. Had I the time, I would climb out of the car and stroll around, shake hands with ladies, lie down on the knoll and read a book. Say, Moby Dick, where Ahab tries to fish Leviathan from the ocean with a hook. Some analogies for President Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. I just, um, I don't know. I can't look at the uh, the Zapruder film without thinking of you narrating it now. Mm, I hope that makes it a little more bearable because it shows a an unbearable but important mm -hmm. uh, truth about America and being an American. It does. And every November, we kind of, you know, refresh our memory. Yeah, we do. Um, if we have time, I'd, I'd like to read uh, from the section of the book, which is about um, literary characters. And there's several Shakespeare-related poems, one called Polonius's Lament and another called Barnardine. Yeah, sure. Just let me know the page number so I can throw it up. Oh, that's right. Sure. Um, 40. Polonius, of course, is the father of Ophelia, Hamlet's girlfriend, who um, loses all the men in her life and goes crazy and uh, takes her own life. And uh, the way she loses her dad is that her uh, boyfriend, Hamlet, accidentally kills him, thinking he's killing the villain of the story. Uh, kills the unseen good old man, right? Polonius lament. Ophelia, I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a certain term to starve in deserts of the mind, unsaying word by word the decades of my rant, my heartless jibes and carping. Guided by the shades of ancient sinners, I repent me now of all my spying, lying, sniveling pride, my busy seeking. I turn about to pledge in terms most absolute and evergreen, full, humble restitution of my undelivered love, together with those blessings I poured out upon your brother's head from yesterday and my death until the end of time. Amen. You that I neglected, used and traded as I would a calf, you that I destroyed your heart upon my broken horn, my bitter, petty prudence, my infected brain of envy, oh, Ophelia, I repent me all my sins against thee and revere your holy love that frightened me. Your royal lover loves you after all. I was wrong and died of it. After earth and flesh, in Hades, all we sorry shades disport us in such business as we knew in life. But now, O oh, daughter whom I burden with these secrets, oh, now we fast in fires we do not consume and though we burn yet are we not consumed i come to beg forgiveness the wind behind me shakes the reeds on lethe wharf forgive me forgive me forgive me lady forget me Polonius lament. 
Yeah. Yeah. I'll plug my friend uh, Joanne Bain's uh, uh, monthly art salon called Pondwater uh, in Covina. I was one of the, I think you read with me, right? Long time I did, ago, like way back then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read there again this year. And, uh, you know, she's doing great. It's a popular, uh, um, you know, poetry event. It's in this broad open backyard. Yeah. And uh, read, I, read, I did recently. Yeah, I should just say that. It's, a, it's amazing. I love that, that she does that. Just, she opens her house to poets once a month i think they're monthly and you just in her backyard there's a big poetry reading and i just wish uh, that more people would do that kind of thing it's an amazing sort of community that she's built just because she enjoys poetry and wants to hear people read so uh, it's really That's cool and, and it's called pond water because she's got a uh, i think a a, a a koi pond in the backyard that's kind of overgrown. Is that, is that if I remember right? It's true. Yeah. It used to be a swimming pool. Now it's yeah, a koi pond. Yeah, she makes dinner. It's kind of a potluck and she makes some food and other people bring food. And it's an amazing communal thing that, uh, that poetry makes possible and that makes possible poetry at the same time. So I love it. I love it. I'm going to read you a short one called Music. Just waves in the world. Music is a state of the air. Just warm and moving meat. The body is a state of the soil. Compressions of the wind or of the still air that waits. Vibrations of three tiny bones inside the ear combined to conjure sound from math. Music is messages inscrutable. It is an aimless summons. Heed, it says. Heed what? Come, it urges. Where? Remember. Which thing? Yearn. And that we can do. A little poem called Music. There's animal poems in one section, and, and there's, strangely enough, there's more than one poem about flies dying or being killed. And this was called The Death of the Fly. And it's quite an unpleasant poem. But like so much unpleasantness, if you stick with it, well, the only way around is through. The Death of the Fly. Through the frog's throat, the fly goes buzzing madly. Wet wings folded useless in the foreign slime. And traumas telescoped equations slow down time into a million razor-thin splinters of panic. Moving through the dying bug still struggling to be free or dead but not enveloped any more in acid darkness, burning all over, violated. The fly's complicated body fails. Its spirit, simple, shakes once and sifts its way outside. The death of the fly. Let's do uh, let's do one more poem, if you don't mind. Great. But uh, but first, I let's talk a little bit. One thing we didn't really talk about is this kind of idea of um, the struggle between having a professional practice and being a yeah. public poet who writes about deep things and your own issues and yeah. and all that stuff. Uh, how do you? I think that's something, uh, you know, I wouldn't have thought that this was something that poets had to worry as much about as they do now in 2019, because so much is public now and so much is Googleable. And, um, you know, do you worry about what you publish influencing your practice as a psychoanalyst? Well, I do. Yeah, I worry, worry about it a lot. And I would, I aspire to worry about it a whole lot less. Um it's been difficult to gather reliable information about just what the risks are of um, maintaining and trying to indeed expand and uh, call attention to an artistic career in any of the fine arts, uh, particularly perhaps poetry, because self-disclosure is 
pretty near the heart of what it is, you know, uh, to make these poems. I mean, sometimes you're writing about the United States or about, um, um, you know, the cosmos, but damn near everything you say, of course, it's from your heart and your history. Mm -hmm. If not the direct subject, it's shaping what you are saying about whatever you're talking about. So it's hard to know. I have these claims that I make, such as the ones I said at the, at the beginning of, of, of the show about why it shouldn't drive anyone away, you know, from seeing a particular therapist to learn from reading her memoir, let's say, that uh, she's been divorced and uh, uh, has uh, her own struggles with mood and therefore uh, having a, um, a doctorate in psychology, uh, psychoanalysis in particular, in my own case, and being a licensed marriage and family therapist, the person is both trained uh, uh, to um, understand depression, anxiety, uh, yearning, envy, regret, also, and so on, grieving, uh, but also has done some of all these things and been shaped by it. And it's part of the reason why you would seek a therapist who, for example, was not as young uh, as yourself, perhaps. It's not always necessary, but it's one of the thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, poetry is a uh, advantageous in that regard, it may be disadvantageous for patients who are of the belief that in order to give a good advice to people who are in difficulty, one must have oneself solved all the problems in one's own life that they over there are experiencing and have done so at no cost, as it were. Mm -hmm. This seems to me is not the way things work and there are, you know, not every choreographer is him or herself at that moment uh, dancing like Rudolf Nureyev, you understand. The conductor is not uh, the first violin, there's different, uh, there's a division of labor, you see. Uh, nor, as I mentioned, are my own, uh, my, my entire life is by no means revealed in, in my work and the videos that I make reading poems of my own and of other people, but yeah, it's, it's forthcoming. I am convinced, however, not enough to stop being concerned about it, because I don't have the facts. I'm convinced that ultimately I am able to not only disclose um, the potentially anxiety-provoking things that one gleans from the work that I do outside of my clinical practice, the artistic work, but also that same material conveys a certain depth of feeling, respect, uh, for people, um, a, a, a core allegiance to the dignity and safety of everybody um, uh, that is the main thing, uh, the empathy itself uh, that you want in a therapy, that's the criterion, you know, it's the, it's the empathy first and foremost, and then the skill set, you know, nobody's perfect, but if you have a person with a good basket of skills and, uh, and attributes and the empathy is there, then that's where you want to go. And you can, I think, um, get a feel for who I am and what my heart is like. And indeed, even perhaps what it's like uh, to be in the room with me collaborating on, uh, on some problem solving and some search for meaning uh, uh, in a broken world. Uh, why not use a pen name? Uh, um, Kat Lehman, uh just posted a comment. She said she uses her uh, different names as um, the poet and the uh, and her. She's a scientist. She was on the podcast a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know A.M. Jester, who is a uh, he was the we interviewed him in Rattle Number I think fifty four. A.M. Jester book for the first time. I just I had, yes, I just bought his Billy Collins yeah, book. Just just to because, finish the you know the explanation, but he was the uh, Billy yeah yeah he was the um um. Um, what's the word? He was the head of the Social Security Administration and um, mm -hmm. as his, his regular name. And um, he wrote as A.M. Jester. So why not you, Jamie Hecht, write as uh, some kind of, uh, you know, mix up of your name or something? Well, I appreciate the suggestion and I'm sure there is some wisdom to it. Um, I have been writing and uh, publishing poems and some short fiction had a short story in American short fiction in 2010. I'm very proud of that publication. It was a short story called Tim, the Immortal Giraffe. I've been writing since I was uh, in my 20s. And my first career was a professor of English and American literature. Mm -hmm. And I only started to um, 
uh, started the business becoming a psychotherapist in 2010, went back to graduate school, got a master's at Antioch, and then did psychoanalytic training for eight years and finished a, a PsyD at the new Center for Psychoanalysis uh, just this oh, summer. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm in private practice in Beverly Hills. Uh, can I mention the oh, address? Oh, whatever you want to mention. I don't care. South Beverly Drive, a few blocks from Olympic Boulevard. And you, have a, you have a website, and, too, uh, for your practice, yeah. right? You could say that. Okay, I appreciate that. It's dr for doctor, mm -hmm. jamiehecht.com. And that's J A M E Y H E C H T. Um, why not use a, a pen name? Good question. Uh, I, I've been doing it so long, and if I were to just stop that, it would. That would feel like a, a, it would kind of defeat the purpose. Because the poems feel as though they come from somewhere outside me that is not subject to the limitations of my imagination, my short-sightedness, and so on, I feel as if I have a responsibility to the poems themselves, as though they were gifts entrusted to me um, by this divine mystery. And my job then is to make sure they're as, in as good shape as possible, you know, check in with these poems periodically, see if they need any revisions, it's like a haircut for a child. And then you find an appropriate place to try and find a home for it. You send it out. If it comes back, you comb its hair again. And uh, you try and advance its interests out in the world uh, with the best presses and literary magazines that you can find, like Rattle. Now, that's very convenient for me because it means I can advocate for my work without worrying about whether I am being uh, unbecomingly narcissistic, overly concerned with my own interests. No, it's not about my brand or my face. The name... Jamie Hecht is a handle by which I am hoping this body of work can be grasped to some degree by the culture. I'm hoping people will read the book and enjoy it, and that some of those people might put a few words together in print or online about the book and how they uh, experienced it. You know, some some reviews because that would yeah it would gratify my narcissism, no question. <laughs> but from my perspective, that would not spoil the partial fulfillment of that, I think, rather beautiful, if somewhat onerous, responsibility to the poems and their ultimate source. Great. Well, thanks, Jamie. I, I kind of sort of imagined your answer would be along those lines, and that was very well articulated. I appreciate it. Thank you. Do you sure, want to close out with one last poem? I'll read a sonnet called Pyro. I'll finally admit this, since I'm getting old. When I was a kid, food stamps bought a brick of government cheese orange solid cold i covered its scary glow with ranger rick magazine a raccoon with ranger expertise what is government and how do they turn it into cheese i must have tried a piece and been grossed out i'd go out back and burn the cardboard sleeve it came in. Did I know it meant we were broke? I held the plastic lens in place, staring at the flame as though my heart had started it. I guess that depends on what the poets or psychiatrists decide. Even at seven, I knew I was too hot inside. Little sonnet there. Thanks, Jamie. Thank yeah. you so much yeah, that's a... for this opportunity. I had a blast, Tim, and I appreciate Great it. Great way to end it. Thanks so much for, for being the guest on this podcast. Uh, and and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks again, Tim. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. You too. So, uh, once again, that was Jamie Hecht and uh, reading from his new book, which just came out. I'll look at the show you the back here. That was uh, Dodo Feathers by Jamie Hecht. There he is, published by 